Hello, everyone. You'll have to forgive me. I've just landed in your beautiful Teagle Airport, so I'm a little uh, still trying to wake up since my early morning flight. I, I'm going to show you a few things, so I think looking at the screen is going to help in this session. And hopefully most of the stuff you see is going to be fun stuff, things you like. So my name is Amit. I work for Google in London. And I'm currently looking after something called the Google Cultural Institute, uh, working with partners, working with people who have content, cultural content. I'm going to do a quick check, because I need to understand how many people have seen the Google Art Project before. So if you can just put your hands up. Wow. OK, that's pretty good. So I'm going to do a very quick demo of the product, just to reiterate the point, and then you know, move to the three other projects. Before I get started, I want you to have an open mind to what you're seeing. And for a minute, I try this, it's like therapy. Close your eyes and forget that it's Google doing it. It helps. It really helps. Just don't think about Google. Don't think about all the stereotypes you have about Google. Just, just think of it as culture and art. And then let's talk about why Google is doing it. So the first project the Google Art project that I'm going to show you, in fact, all three, was started as 20% projects at Google. This is really important uh, for you guys to understand because what it means is this is not a top-down company strategy. This is not Larry and Sergey saying, you know, go and digitize the entire cultural world. It's, it's not one of those things. It's really coming from the bottom, from the employees who are passionate about these projects. So I used to work in Android in the mobile area for Google, and I started the art project as a 20%, which means I used to work on my weekends with a lot of other Googlers trying to get this done. The same way the archive project and the wonders of the world, which I'm going to show you, all have been started by mid to junior level Googles, uh, Googlers who have then gone and made the project big. And then Google has given it a home in the Google Cultural Institute. So that's the genesis of the projects. So, You'll have to bear with me. This is not my laptop. So I'm going to hope that I can operate it safely. Uh, so I have to first try and get the browser up because the, everything has, the, the menu has disappeared. So I just need to get the browser uh, maybe. Yeah, I th and if we can just try and. Perfect. All right, I, I hope it's OK for you all on the screen. It's not perfect for me, but you know, when you go home, hopefully you can have more fun with it. So here's a website that you come to, and you don't really notice that you know, it's not really a Google-styled website. And the idea with the Google Art Project is three things. It's very simple. We wanted to create an experience online for art that is not about reading lots of text, going through catalogs or databases. So it's not about quantity, it's about quality. It's about how you capture the artwork, how you show it to the user, and how you put it in context. These are the three critical things of this project. So we started it and launched the first phase in 2011. We started the first phase in 2011 with 17 museums. No. With 17 museums. Simon is here. He was one of our first partners from Germany. He's sitting there. He's from the Berlin Museums. And essentially, the 17 museum concept scaled to 151 museums in 40 countries, which we launched in April. So we went from 17 as a small little idea to 151 in around 40 markets. So let's just quickly. Okay, I'm trying to click the mouse, but. I don't think the trackpad is working. Yeah. All right. Let's try. <laughs> so this is going to be an interesting demo, because some of the trackpad is not working, so just bear with me. Uh, but essentially, let's take this museum, for example. This is the Museo Botero in Bogota. And essentially, what you first come to is a view 
of a collection of works provided by the museum. All these works are provided, most of them, by the museum. And each one is provided in a resolution that allows users to have a slightly more immersive experience with the work. Now, these are, you know, bananas. So if you really love bananas, you know, you can have a very immersive experience. But this gets very powerful when you go into masterpieces like Van Gogh, Bruegel, and, you know, artworks that have a lot of details, which I'm going to try and take you to if I can get this to work. Here, here is where you have the context of the artwork, if the museum has provided it. So let's go right now very quickly. I'm just going to try and see if I can. Let's, for example, go to, uh, let's go to the Adachi Museum in Japan. I was trying to find a German museum, but with the with the mouse not working, I don't want to take the risk. <laughs> so once again, you have this view. Now this is what we call the gigapixel, which is the extremely high resolution artwork. And here, you can really start zooming. We're doing this on the fly. There's no software, no login, nothing. And you can start getting to minute details of the artwork. Now, every artwork does not need this treatment. I think we all agree. It's only specific artworks. And the, and the beauty of the art project is the control is with the partner. So the partner chooses which artwork should get the treatment, which artwork should not get the treatment. And I'm going to, I wanted to show you one Latin American museum. I've shown you one Asian. And I'm going to try and now show you one American, if I can. Usually, there's a search, by the way, but it's hidden because of the browser, so I can't access it. Uh, all right, let's just go to the Metropolitan. So I think most of you, I hope, are aware, because this is the cultural audience, of this painting. It's The Harvesters by uh, Peter Bruegel the Elder, one of my favorites. And it became my favorite after the art project. And I've stood in front of this painting many, many times. But I have never been able to really explore it the way I can now. So. If you know Bruegel, you know that it's all about details. It's all about stories within the artwork. You know, by seeing the expressions of people and really moving around. We can spend probably one day just discovering the stories in this painting. So I'm going to zoom out, and I'm going to show you something happening here where my mouse is. And now I'm going to start slowly zooming in. When I first saw this around three years ago, I was shocked. This is a painting made in 1565. And I started looking at these details, and obviously there's a story. The artist is trying to tell us something. And so I spoke to some people at the Met, and they told me this is a game. This is a game that's played, or used to be played in medieval times called Skol, which involves hitting a geese with a stick on Shrove Tuesday. Now, I'm from India. We try not to hit our animals too hard. But, uh, you know, it was fascinating. It was fascinating to see this, to understand this. And then if you really, you know, I can't get you the actual face of the geese, but if you actually zoom out, now I just want you to focus. That's the context of where we are. Um, I'm not an artist, I'm not a historian, I'm not a curator, so I don't really know if this is valuable for other paintings or not. I just know that technology has some benefits to enjoying art online. That's the premise we started with. And of course, we have the much-loved Street View, which we worked with. So we went to the Street View team, uh, who were some friends of mine, and we said, can you design something that allows me to go inside a museum without knocking down the paintings? Without, it can't be a car. It can't be an automated thing. And so they worked with us for around a year and a half, testing a thing we call the trolley, which allows us to go inside museums and do internal room captures. So really think of this from a point of you know, access. And this conference theme is access. And think of new audiences. That's my personal motivation for starting this project. Most of you are very lucky. You all don't realize it. But in countries, for example, let's say my country, you don't get up on a Saturday or on a Sunday and go to a museum. It's not part of our culture. Uh, we sadly now go to McDonald's or to movies. 
And you know, I wish people would go more to museums because they are a great space, not just to view art, but to socialize, to interact. And what this really does, and I've, I've, I've seen it now for two years because I've been going on talks in India, in Latin America, in the Middle East, what it really does is gives people an understanding that maybe when they plan their next trip, they might go to a museum. Maybe they would encourage their local community to you know, have a museum experience. So it's really about getting other people excited, new audiences, because I think y'all are convinced that museums are a good experience, but there are many, many others who don't have access to it and hence are not convinced. So there's a lot more in this project. I can spend one hour just doing the demo of this project. A lot of tools for people who might you know, be in education to play around with. I'm, I'm just trying to show you very quickly that what happens when you have collaboration in the cultural sector. Uh, we all know the famous uh, Dutch artist, uh, Johannes Vermeer, and we know that Vermeer painted very few works in his lifetime. Uh, from what I understand, they're probably, I don't know, 21 or 40. I've, I've been told it's a very small number. By complete coincidence, we did not plan it, but this project, let me, uh, I can't scroll down because the browser won't let me. Oh, that's a pity. Uh, I just need to scroll down. Two fingers? Yeah. Yeah. No. No. Let me see if the enter works. All right, well, I can't show it to you what I want to show you, but what I, what I want to show that if you go home and do Vermeer, you will see 14 of his works from nine different museums across the world, all represented in high resolution. Uh, a, a researcher, education researcher, told me that this is probably one of the most beneficial things for him that he has ever seen because he has had to travel to all these museums to study Vermeer. And now he actually, he will still travel, but at least it cuts the travel down a little bit for him. So a lot of other fun stuff, and let's move to the second project. So the second project is really, uh, again, I'm having some browser problems, so I'm not going to be able to navigate this, uh, but I can tell you the idea. The idea of this project is called Wonders of the World. It was started by a colleague of mine, actually from the German office, and she saw art project, and she said she wants to do something similar, but for architecture for historical sites. And so she worked with the Street View team to capture hundreds of locations around the world in Street View, and then worked with UNESCO and the World Monument Fund to provide contextual information. So let me try and click on one of them. So let's see if I can click on this and it might work. So here we are. This is all live in Street View right now. And it's really focused, because you can get quite lost in Street View. And this is really focused on just architectural buildings and places of interest. And of course, unlike you know, in the real Street View, you can also have a lot of contextual information. And this is what happens when you work with people who have authority over the content. And this is one of the strong views of the Cultural Institute, is that we have to work with partners who really have authority over the content, because otherwise, for these type of, these type of uh, projects, it's very difficult to get you know, academics, education people to really get interested because they want, the, you know, they want the authoritative context. So there's a lot more here. There are themes, archaeological sites, architecture, places of worship, cities and towns, historical sites. We can again spend half an hour just doing demo of this. Monuments and memorials. And we are adding every week more and more content here. So now let's go to the third project, which I hope the browser will be more friendly towards. OK. So this is brand new. It just launched two weeks ago. So I showed you art. I showed you architecture, archaeology. And now I'm going to show you archives. Archives, I think, are the little gems in the cultural world that not many people really either know about, care about, or talk about. And Archives can really benefit more than anything, in my opinion, from technology. Art, at least you can go to a museum and see it on the wall. But to see thousands of records of archives and have a story behind it, it's very difficult. So we worked with 17 partners 
similar to the art project idea, which is we start small, always start small, work with a small bunch of partners, see if the idea is accepted, and then we scale it. So we worked with partners like the Nelson Mandela Foundation in South Africa, uh, the Yad Vashem Museum in Israel, the uh, Freya Sackler in Smithsonian in, the Washington, in Washington, D.C. And what we created essentially is a beautiful way of telling a story. Uh, Steve Biko. So let's, let's get into this exhibition. I'm not sure how many of you know who Steve Biko is. I didn't, by the way. So you do, great. So I didn't before I started this. And uh, uh, my, the team who worked on this were very passionate to tell these stories. So we worked with curators. So you have the partner who gives the content, but then you also have curators who actually lay out a digital exhibition. So think of it as a digital exhibition. And, oh, the browser is not, ah, okay. Hopefully I can just navigate quickly. So the idea is really to show what can happen when you have text, image, and audio and video mixed together. So here you start the story of Biko. There is references and photographs. I'm not gonna actually tell you the story because that'll take a long time. But there are quotes by his mother. There's his house where he was actually born, why he actually fought the way he did, what was his thinking. There is also, for example, uh, here is his secondary school, senior secondary school mark sheet. I mean, these are documents that are lost, and it's all about putting them in context to tell a larger story. And you can also have you know, more and more and more. So the idea is really, and here are all the partners who provided the content. Here's the media with the credits. And let's say I want to jump to another exhibition. There are around 42 exhibitions right now on the platform. We just launched it two weeks ago. And if you are, if you are an academic, and you don't really care so much about the exhibition, you just want straight, raw, archival content. We've built a new tool, and let's just go to uh, the live photo collection. So we worked with the live photo collection, and you now have a very easy, pretty powerful tool in the background that allows you to sort through content. So if you wanted to filter, this is the live photo archive content, and if you wanted to just filter saying, I want all objects from Germany, that are in the live photo archive. Here you have, well, I'm not gonna focus on that, but here you have more and essentially we don't control what content comes in, but it's up to the partner to provide the metadata, to provide the tagging, and that way we can have millions of objects sorted easily. We also have timelines that can allow you to sort the information and many other features. So I'm not gonna get into those. So let's just uh, recap now for one second, because I've showed you three projects that have taken a lot of people, a lot of years to complete. You've seen art, immersive, street view, artwork, exploring. You've seen wonders of the world, contextual information, street view, and you've seen archives, which is all about powered by technology and beautiful digital exhibitions. And we don't know what's next for us at the Cultural Institute. We, we see ideas coming from Google people and partners every day. We talk to the partners regularly to try and figure out what we should do next. Right now, our focus is to keep building on these three areas because I think there's a lot more to be still done. And one thing to mention, the whole Google Cultural Institute is non-commercial. And this is very important because a lot of people, you know, we can also take some questions and I'm sure the questions will come up saying, you know, what does the contracts look like? Why are people doing this with Google? And I can answer all of them because you can imagine I have now spent quite a bit of my career speaking to lawyers from 151 museums in 40 countries, trying to convince them. And the idea is this is non-commercial, non-profit, uh, and hopefully we can continue to keep doing this stuff with the support of the partners and the users. In terms of traffic, all projects have attracted huge amount of traffic users. Art Project recently crossed around 13 million visitors from around 30 countries. Uh, we have countries ranging in our traffic profile, Brazil, India, Russia, China, I mean, coming to visit museums in completely different countries. Some of this traffic goes back to the partner's website as well, and the World of Wonders as well is in the millions, and the Archive Project has just launched. So I think I'll pause now,
and I think it'll be very interesting to take questions. Please feel free to ask me anything, however controversial it might be, because you know, I'm kind of used to it all by now. So thank you very much. Okay, now the questions, the questions you all know, and hopefully at least one or two questions that are surprisingly for you so that it's not all boring for you. Um, I have two questions. Firstly, um, how do I sign up? Uh, that would be, that'd be great. We'd, we'd love to take part in a project like that. Um, and secondly, I, the thing about the art gallery uh, site is that it, it, it's very much designed to replicate the experience of going to an art gallery in some aspects. You've taken a lot of time and effort over that, it seems to me. But why did you decide not to do that with the archives site? It's not like going to an archive. It's not about replicating that experience. I wondered what the thinking behind that was. I'll give the archive designers feedback on that. <laughs> they think that they did replicate the experience. <laughs> but uh, let, me, let me try and answer your question quickly. So to sign up, just come talk to me. Michael from my team is just behind there. We are going to be here for maybe 10 minutes, and then we have to rush to catch a flight back. But we are more than happy to you know, sign up more partners. Uh, the art experience, actually, we do not want to replicate the physical experience. Uh, we wanted to come as close as we could because we still think the physical experience is the most valuable, and I still strongly believe that. However, with archives, most of these archives that we actually saw were in lockers, hidden in rooms with a lock and key. I mean, I can try and replicate that experience online, but I don't think anyone will like it. So the idea was, Let's open up the vault, so to speak. Some archives have beautiful displays you know, in a museum. Some archives are laid out beautifully. And the plan is to start doing Street View with some of those archives as well. But the main idea for the archives, it came from the partners. And the partners said, we want a way to mix audio, text, video, and have an exhibition. And so we said, that's fine. But I hope we evolve from there to make it a little bit more immersive. I agree with you. It needs more work. More questions? Don't disappoint him. Oh, Barbara Fischer. Oh, I'll there. be more than happy if there's no questions. <laughs> OK. <laughs> My question concerns the art project. Um, I like it a lot, the, the idea that I could be stated in Berlin and visit an, an exhibition in Moscow, because probably I won't get there so soon this year. Um, but. Is there a plan also that I could rearrange the exhibition? Um, that I could choose among the pictures uh, that the specific museum has and, and then rearrange it in, in, inside the museum and then watch my own exhibition, maybe share it with my friends? User galleries. User galleries allows you to pick any artwork from any collection, make your own mu little museum, share it with your friends. Well, but I won't have the, the building. I will just have a virtual room. It's not the same, is I it? I love it. I give a little, but more is asked. <laughs> <laughs> so we would love to include Street View in it as well. But technically, that's a little bit more difficult. So what we said is, let's start with the artworks. And let's you know, create this experience. The other thing you must understand is, a lot of our partners who gave us this content are very scared, are very scared about what will happen to this content on the internet. Will people hack it? Will people download it? Right? This comes up in every meeting. And what I tell people is that you know, the internet, anything can be downloaded. Right? First of all, you have to come to terms with that reality. On this site, we don't allow the downloading. So when you make your user collections, a lot of the users say, I want to actually download and create my gallery. That we can't allow, because partners are not comfortable with that at the moment. So what we allow you to is drag the collection, and you get a URL. You get a link that you can send around. And so I hope more and more people will work with partners to bring them on board in a constructive fashion. Like, because at the end of the day, until they get comfortable with sharing the content, there's no point of doing these projects. Right? They have to be comfortable. And I hope you know, your, what you're asking, maybe if museums say, fine, let users create even the Street View panoramas. We don't mind. 
that's great. But the decision, I think, has to be from the partners because they are the custodians of the co content. Okay. So the question goes back to, uh, uh, to the museums and the archives, and we have to think about that. There's another question. So, um, Johannes Fischer, freelance journalist from Berlin. Um, what I especially like about the Google R project is the interface, so uh, the way you present these things. But as you right mentioned, um, you are dealing with museums that are scared to, let's say, open data to give things on a, um, let's say, on a, uh, on a Creative Commons license. So, as I understand, Google has uh, very much um, taken benefit of, yeah, of the open structure of the internet, which, which in a specific kind Creative Commons, for example, represents. Why, if Google, the Google R project has such a strong position, why is it not using to help others um, to, to go this way and in, in, yeah, open up their cultural heritage? Because you are in the perfect position to do that. I know that's another question that I gave a little bit, but you want some more, but I think you are in the perfect position to do that. I, I agree, and you know, I, think, I think we are trying. I think, I think my view is a great example. Uh, yeah, should I go ahead? Yeah. So, the Metropolitan Museum in the US, before the Google Art Project, they didn't really have a lot of their content online. Forget about download, they didn't have it online. They have recently put up one of the largest collections a museum has put up of high resolution artworks on their website, available for download. They're going even one step ahead of Google Art Project. And so it is starting, it is happening, but I think it's all about comfort level and trust, right? So when we go to the partner, we do tell the partner that it would be better if you open up your collection, make it more easy. But, you know, it's up to them, really. I mean, if they don't actually feel that there's any benefit, then why do it? And the benefit is there because you get new audiences, you get people interacting much more with your content, which in relation could benefit attendance figures, could benefit brand publicity. There's so many after effects. So our job is really trying to tell them is that tell us your concerns, we'll address them as much as you can, but the decision has to come from the partners. Okay, yeah, um, I just want to add one thing from my perspective. I think one of the reasons why, why we make a conference like this is to discuss even uh, these questions. I mean, um, as we have heard, um, the conditions are the conditions the partners, the archives and museums are asked to have. So we have to think, we have to discuss what, what conditions of access do we want. And we have to discuss it all together. And um, I hope this discussion will continue and will go on. And uh, it might be controversial in one way or the other, but this, uh, this discussion is very, very important. And that's the reason why we do a conference like that. Um, I've I have only one uh, very quick question. Uh, there is a study in Germany that says that a regular viewer in a museum spends a, uh, an average 11 seconds in front of a painting before it goes to the next one. Uh, how's your experience with the Google Art Project? Uh, how, how do people really use, uh, use it? You showed us uh, the great uh, detail I can, I can zoom in, but how do people uh, use, use it on an average scale? I know the number, but I have never revealed it publicly. I don't mind revealing it. But it's the uh, first time I've been asked this question, so it's a great question. On the Google Art Project, currently, what we are seeing, and this is not, this is approximate, because I don't have the analytics in front of me, we are seeing over a minute or close being spent on one artwork. I mean, people who really understand the internet will tell you that's quite significant, because people's attention span on the internet is very, very low. Uh, so, you know, we are quite encouraged by this, and I think, you know, hopefully this will result in better physical viewing as well. So, Simon? Hi, I mean, thank you for the presentation. Um, I guess there are a lot of museums who want to be part of the project. How exactly do you decide what museums can take part of the uh, art project? Surprising you're asking me that question uh, <laughs> because you got on in the first round, but uh, Let's think about how you got on in the first round. Why was Berlin Museums chosen in the first round? We didn't choose. I had Michael who had a contact. He called the contact and said we are doing this crazy idea. Would you like to join? 
you guys took the risk, right? So that's, and I'm, I'm simplifying it, but what I'm trying to say is that we don't really choose the partners, but yes, we, we can't wait forever for partners to join, so we, because resources are very limited for this type of activity in Google. It doesn't bring any money. So you have to understand that internally, we also have to you know, justify why we are doing this, how much resources we are spending. So our view to partners is there's a sign-up form on the website. For art project, there's a sign-up form. For the archive project, there's a sign-up form. The minute you sign up, someone will contact you and provide you with the template, the contracts. And then it's really up to the partner to say, OK, I'm in. And if the partner wants to negotiate for six to eight months, then we say sorry, because we don't have the resource to do the negotiation for every single partner. Okay. No more questions, or I guess there are many questions, but they were asked uh, to you at lunch break. So we have lunch you won't break. Won't be now. at lunch. You won't be at lunch. I have but to rush. Okay. So thank you very much uh, thank you. to join us, and uh, it was fun. It was great to have you here. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you.